Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by Director of Research at the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma, Dr. Mal McHugh. Mal McHugh received his PhD in exercise physiology in 1999 from the University of Wales, Bangor. Since 99, Dr. McHugh has been the Director of Research at the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. He has led a multidisciplinary research team, including orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists, exercise physiologists, nutritionists, biomechanists, medical engineers, and athletic trainers. The research encompasses areas such as randomized clinical trials in orthopedic sports medicine, injury epidemiology, and basic and applied research in nutrition, physiology, and biomechanics. Mal is a fellow at the American College of Sports Medicine, associate member of the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, and a member of the Orthopedic Research Society. This is an outstanding episode. I was fortunate enough to be introduced to Mal from Reg Grant. Uh, it's an unbelievable hour plus minutes of education talking about his research, diving deep into testing hip asymmetry, specifically the drawbacks of adductor squeeze tests. Very, very powerful information, major aha moments for me. Fantastic hour. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Mal. Thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk to you today. You were informally introduced to me through a, a colleague, uh, Reg Grant, who has a ton of respect for you. He said, Anth, you have to get this individual on the podcast. And after chatting with you for, geez, probably about 30 minutes on the phone, I was aha moments left and right. So I'm really, really excited to chat with you and, and, and share a lot of the information from our audience, which Mal really is strength and conditioning coaches in the National Hockey League, Division One college coaches, physical therapists, performance staff, hockey fans alike. So let me start with where you're at currently, Doc. Director of Research at the Nichols Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma. Could you give us an overview of what, what you do there and what a normal day encompasses for you right now? Yeah, so the Nichols Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma, known as NISMAT, is actually the first hospital-based institute to study sports medicine in the U.S. It was founded in 1973 by Dr. James Nicholas, and he's one of the fathers of sports medicine. So in 1973, he was the team physician for the New York Rangers, the New York Islanders, the New York Jets, the New York Knicks, the New York Cosmos, the Joffrey Ballet Company, was also a consultant with the New York Yankees. And Jeez. he covered all of sports medicine and he started this institute, which in the 1980s was named after him. It was originally the Institute and then it was the Nicholas Institute. And he had a very unique perspective on sports medicine that it should not be about torn ligaments, torn muscles. It should be about all of physical activity, which now, nowadays we would think of incorporate sports science and biomechanics. But he saw that sports medicine was a big thing about letting athletes and people doing recreational activities be able to do those activities to their best ability no matter what age no matter what level of ability and in my day-to-day -day work i'm the director of research we do a lot of research but i also do a lot of work in sports science that's not research for different you know advising people and the philosophies that dr nicholas had in originating sports medicine, we still apply to our day-to-day -day practice, so basically trying to further the science of sports medicine and sports science so that people are doing things that are evidence-based. And a lot of the time, I one of the phrases I talk about is the, the sanctity of the data. When someone's doing something, measuring things, doing fitness tests, doing research, I'm always looking at, well, what's the sanctity of the data? Can we believe that this data is correct? The sanctity of the data. Very interesting, which kind of leads me in and parlays in to my next question. How do you create a research team? I mean, in defining the question, collecting the data, cleaning the data, is it questions brought to you by students, inquisitive students that you say, hey, this may or may not be a good idea. Let's explore. How does that evolve for you? 
That's a real good question. And usually when somebody says that's a real good question, they're usually going, oh, how do I answer that? I don't know. <laughs> but it is in that it's very somewhat haphazard in that okay. somebody can, like, for example, I got a call last week from an orthopedic surgeon and somebody says, oh, he wants to do some research. He says, you have a golf simulator. And I'm going like, well, what is a golf simulator? What does he mean? We do work in golf biomechanics. And I, I called him back and I was thinking, this is the last thing I need to talk to another guy who has a bad idea about research and I don't have <laughs> to do it. I got to be nice. And it turns out the guy has an interest in a patient population that I was interested in 30 years ago, but nobody knew who they were. So early in my career, I did a lot of work on the viscoelasticity of muscle and what determines flexibility and what determines muscle function throughout different ranges of emotion and how sarcomere function relates to how an athlete performs or a patient performs. And I wanted to look at patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So in the late 80s, early 90s, when I was doing that work, I would say to orthopedic surgeons, do you have any patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome? And they would say, what's that? I've never heard of it. And so nowadays, everybody has kind of knows what Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is. It's a, it's a hyper-flexible connective tissue disorder. And happens to be this doctor deals with a lot of those patients. And I said, well, I don't know what your research question is, but I'm interested because sure. I wanted to study. So that's something where I might go down an avenue to do some work in that area because it's it's a interest I have and an area of expertise that we have. So if people have good ideas and we have expertise in the area, then it might be something that we research. One of the problems with our research is some people have great ideas, but in order to test those research questions, we have either do not have the instrumentation or the expertise with the instrumentation to answer the questions. Sometimes we have the instrumentation and the expertise, but we don't have access to the athletic population or the patient population in enough numbers to answer the question. So... Those are all the factors that factor into what are we going to research at a, at a given time. And we have a team of engineers, biomechanists, physiologists, orthopedic surgeons, physical therapists. We're actually quite small, but we've got people with diverse areas of expertise. And, you know, I've got maybe 50 ongoing studies. Some of them might be the most boring things in the world to me, but they might be the most exciting things in, in the world to one of my colleagues. So that's. And the same, the thing that excites me the most might be like, why are you doing that? Everybody else is saying to me. So, you know, we try to cover as much as we can and get the work done. And it it has to have an impact. You know, it has to make a difference for what people are doing. Yeah. In this day and age specifically, right, with the publisher parish, you see a lot of research that's, I don't know how usable it is for lack of a better word, but you're a serial specialist, in my opinion, looking at the breadth and depth of your research one of the first pieces of work that I had the opportunity to, to learn from you with was your deep dive in the NHL combine. So the NHL combine, the historical analysis, practical analytics and longitudinal data streams. You had history, analysis of results, historical analysis of NHL careers, position specific analysis and future considerations. So let me ask you this without getting too detailed and I don't want to have you give away proprietary information. How did that project come about? That might be the first portion of my question. And then that's a massive stream of data. I know the old saying goes, Mal, is, you know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? How do you go about looking at all that information and saying, okay, how do we organize that, clean it, and create a narrative that is bite-sized, for lack of a better word? So two pieces of that question. First is, how did it come about? Second is data organization and cleaning. So I've been involved in fitness testing of hockey players since, well, since 1999 through about 2018 with New York Rangers. But even back in the early 90s, we used to do the preseason training camp testing when I was a rookie at work. And we would do the Jets in August and the Rangers in September. And this was all with Dr. Nicholas's being in charge of, of those teams. So around 1999, I started doing it more formally with the Rangers where I would come in and I'd run all the tests. 
And so I had years and years of practice. And then I think 2001 or 2002 probably was when I started working with Reg Grant. And so worked with him for about the next 16, 17 years. I'm still working with him. And I saw the limitations and the pitfalls and what's good and what's bad and understand how to how to do these things. And then I was asked to help out with the NHL and oversee some of the work and the combine. And I was very interested in that. And I was going like, okay, what do they do? Why do they do it type of thing? So I came in and <laughs> fortunately, unfortunately, my first year was 2019. I was there more observing what was going on. And then the next two combines were canceled. So that's where I would have got deep dive into the stuff. So they were canceled. That did give me time to go and look at the longitudinal historical data. So the first year I had, I went back to 2008. And then when I realized we're going to have another year off, I said, okay, let's go all the way from 1994 and pull what tests were done, which tests were done each year, which ones were done, and protocols change and this and that. And and like everyone thinks like, Oh, well, who was the best in this test? Who was in the best in that test? And I'm going like, well, you can't really say because there's subtle changes each year. That's right. That's right. You have to normalize each year. So you have to, first of all, know, well, what might change from year to year? Like, for example, something simple. Goaltenders have got taller or the goaltenders they are looking for have got taller. So that's one systematic change over time. I don't know if anything else has changed over time in terms of have they got more aerobically fit or anaerobically fit. There's a certain balance there. We look at certain strength and power tests. So I put all this stuff together and then you would have to basically assume that each year the overall fitness is the same. You're pulling the top 105, 110 college or junior players that are of a certain age and you're putting them together and you say, okay, well, let's assume each year they're around the same. So then if one year you did a VO2 max test on a treadmill and next year you did it on a bike and there's going to be a systematic difference there. So you just have to convert each year to that year's average. So you can convert what I did was Z scores. So sure. if you're average, you're a zero. If you're one standard deviation above average, you're a one. If you're two standard deviation above average, you're two. So you get a Z score for every test and then you can compare apples to apples from each year if you assume that the average of a given test is the same from year to year, which it's not going to be, but it's going to be within a certain range. So that's how I did it. And then I would look at, okay, how do you define whether someone's a professional hockey player? Do we go, they made it to the NHL, they played more than 10 games, they played more than 50 games, they played whatever. You had to come up with some criteria and I applied some criteria. And then I looked at the numbers to see if things were predictive. But there's some research out there published on this and it's not really good. And But part of the problem is, you know, some of these things, if... I want to know, is a high anaerobic power a predictor of making it as a professional hockey player? Well, everybody knows the numbers. And then, so if I go and I'm a prospect and I have a peak wattage per kilogram body weight of 11 watts per kilogram, that's pretty terrible. You want to be, say, 15. And I'm an 11 and the team drafts me they're not going to sit back and go, well, let's see if he makes it to the NHL. They're going to say, well, look at how low he was in this. They're going to train me. So they're going to fix things that they observe in the combine. So by the time you actually go to play for their development squads, their junior teams, whatever, then your fitness has changed because they've addressed things. So now some of the tests are more screening tests. So they may be, you mightn't be able to change them so much. So those are the things we got to think about when we're looking at what's a predictor and what's not a predictor. That may not be the purpose of the testing. We've got to decide what the purpose of the testing is. Is the purpose of the testing to see how fit that person is on this day since they know they're going to be tested on that day? So if they're coming in and they're out of shape, why are they out of shape? Is it because they've had a long season or is it something to do with their personality? Those are the things that the scouts and other people will be looking at. Brilliant. I really like the way that you normalize the data with the Z-scores. And I also like the way, and, and I'm not a deep dive into the statistician by any means, but you know, I felt that when you displayed the data, whether it was with the bar graphs, 
the 95% confidence intervals as error bars and no overlap. And I thought it was a beautiful display in, in a picture standpoint of painting your narrative. How did you decide to come up with that? Was that just something where... I try to approach stats from a point of view that the end user that it's for might be able to understand it. So I could have gone <laughs> into this and said, <laughs> That's uh, great. let's do a logistic regression analysis to see. And I could have said, well, if you throw these four factors together, you have a 4.32 more likelihood of making it to the NHL with these combination of, and then I'm going like, but well, nobody's going to understand that. So, so true. I tried to keep it simpler where I'm applying some of the, proper statistics, but keep it in a way that is transferable to an audience that can say, oh, yeah, because I can see this is too variable or, you know, this is varying too much from year to year for me to rely on that, this data. And we got to understand what that variation is about. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, Michelangelo once said. And I can tell you, thank you for displaying it that way. It was beautifully done. That SCAF presentation that you gave was outstanding. So I commend you on that. And thank you so much for doing that project. It was an eye opener for me and in a lot of good ways. And I think probably the biggest one for me was how you normalize the information and the display of it, I thought was masterful. Well, thank you. I mean, it's just the start. I really need to get update it and keep it going and set it in a way where we can better understand what we're doing. And so there's lots of new stuff that came in that I didn't analyze yet. And I just need to find the time. Well, I'm looking forward to part two, if there is one. I want to slightly pivot Mal here. This is the meat and potatoes of our conversation, baby. I'm excited because I know that uh, after talking with you on the phone the last time, I, I mean, I was, there were several aha moments that went off to me first. And I want to get to those in this conversation. So two studies that I want to go over with you, okay, if you're able to, to mm -hmm. chat with those. Number one, the association of hip strength and flexibility with the incidence of adductor muscle strains in professional ice hockey players. It was a prospective study, 81 National Hockey League players, 47 players after cuts, trades, and sent to minors, which is still a large population of an elite, elite group. My question is, what measures were taken? Can you give us an overview about the actual study and what you found in that study? Yeah, so kudos has to go to Tim Tyler for persevering with this. And this was early in his career. He's a physical therapist and went on to be the president of the American Academy of Sports Physical Therapy. And he worked with us for years. He's still a consultant researcher with us. So he pestered the team to let him to get him access to the players to do the testing and they were engaged but the good part is they were not totally engaged at the time in that they said we told them what we wanted to do and he said okay yeah let's do it and we'll do the testing but if they were totally engaged and we're doing all these tests and i'll talk about what the tests were then if we find players with deficiencies, what well, what people might think are deficiencies, like asymmetries or whatever, then they might address them. And then we can't see if they were actually risk factors for injury. So we come in, we tested them. We didn't really give them reports on the players. So that was a perfect scenario because there's no point in testing people to see what might be a risk factor for injury if somebody's going to address the tests that you've just done. Uh -huh. Yes. So we went in, we tested. So we did hip flexibility, looking at hip flexor flexibility with Thomas test and looking at adduction flexibility, abducting the leg to see a range of motion test. And then we looked at hip strength, looking at hip flexion strength, hip abduction strength, and hip adduction strength. And for that, we used a handheld dynamometer that used to be called the Nicholas Manual Muscle Tester and is now called the Lafayette Manual Muscle Tester. There's a whole history behind that. And it was developed by Dr. Nicholas in the 70s. And we used that. And some of my criticisms of strength testing that you had mentioned and you want to talk about, we'll probably want to talk about, we committed some of those errors in that study where things weren't done as scientifically rigorously as they should have been done. But the study, when you're getting access to elite athletes, you very often only have a limited amount of time and access, and you've got to decide, what can I do quickly? 
that's going to be valid and give us good numbers that we can actually test some research questions. There was a prominent sports science researcher from South Africa who once said, the perfect study exists only in the minds of reviewers who do no research. So you got to understand that. So we got access. We did these tests. And the thing, what we were interested in doing is in order to reduce injuries in any sport or activity, you need to know the size of the problem. So you need to know the incidence of the injury. You need to identify the risk factors for the injury. Then you need to develop interventions to address those risk factors. And then once you've come up with some intervention saying, yeah, this would address, then you see, well, if I then put that intervention into place, will it actually reduce the injuries that we've seen? So will we eliminate the risk or reduce the risk associated with that risk factor? So that's a four-step process. So you've alluded to the first study where we find we identified the size of the problem and looked to see if strength or flexibility were risk factors for that injury. We then went on to, when we identified some risk factors, we then went on to, in the next two years, put into place an intervention to address the deficiencies. And then we followed those players for the subsequent two seasons to see, did we reduce the injuries? And we were able to reduce the injuries by... 78%, I think, was the number. So that was two different papers, step one and step two in the first paper, and step three and four in the second paper. Correct me if I'm wrong, the first paper talked about the adduction to abduction ratio in those tests. Could you expand on those, if you would, to the audience? Some may or may not know. I would imagine most do know. And since then, a lot of technologies come about measuring this ratio. So can you talk first about the ratio and what was found in those individuals that sustained adductor strains? Yeah, and the study really needs to get reproduced, but you'll understand how difficult it is to do a study like that in that sure. population. Especially, well, some teams do the testing and they say, oh, we haven't found that to be a risk factor. And I'll tell you what it was. And I said, yeah, because you test it and you know that it might be a risk factor and you're going to correct it. So that's the... But so what we found was that if your adductors were less than 80% of your abductors, your adductor strength was less than 80% of your abduction strength, you were at increased risk of a hip adductor muscle strain. So we were originally interested in hip flexor strains and other sports hernia type things, athletic pupils type things, but we didn't get enough of those. And we got to understand is it's not that large a number of injuries. Sure. Really, to do this in the perfect world, you would have had more than one team, or if it was one team, you would have four seasons. We had one team in two seasons. We got 11 adductor strains. And that was enough for us to look at, but it's still small. The interesting thing is the ratio was the best predictor, but the reason the ratio was the best predictor was that our measure of strength with this handheld dynamometer was in newtons. And it shouldn't be in newtons. It should be in newton meters per kilogram body weight, meaning we're applying a handheld dynamometer, say hip adduction. It's in side lying. They're lifting their leg up. We're doing a brake test, pushing down, measuring the force at the ankle. So if we get 100 newtons of force, that force should be measured by the length of the lever arm, so the length from the ankle to the center of rotation of the hip, which is approximately where the greater true counter is. So you can do that length. And then you can divide that by the person's body mass in kilograms. And that means I can compare my strength to your strength. I can compare each player's strength to another player's strength. And then that's how, and we've done that in subsequent studies with other sports and other injuries where you're looking at torque per kilogram body weight and how that is compares across players. We didn't do that in that study. So Newton's of force was not a risk factor. The strong, it was close, but if we had a measured torque, we probably would have come up with an absolute measure of strength that might have been a risk factor for adductor strains. In reality, we came up with the ratio because when you do the ratio, it doesn't matter whether it's force or torque because it's just the adductors versus the abductors. And on average, the players' adductors were about 96% of their abductors. So there's a parity there. They're mostly close together. If that fell below the 80% mark, that's where we saw the increased risk. 
This episode has been brought to you by the High Performance Hockey Masterclass. The High Performance Hockey Masterclass is a comprehensive lecture series exploring the science and practice of the high performers in the sport of ice hockey. It was designed and created and engineered by myself, Anthony Donskoff. It is an eight-part lecture series that includes metric fixation, the tyranny of metrics, reading research, what matters, going back to get my PhD as a 40-year-old, how do you target your readings in terms of digesting, accumulating, and reading your research, biomechanical considerations for ice hockey, the adductor magnus, how we program hip health during the off-season and in-season, the gain, go, grow model, this idea of a three-day rollover program for high-performance hockey players, considerations for the in-season, how to manipulate that model for high performers, our communication structure within the confines of Don Scott's strength and conditioning, and finally, the fast and frugal tree, considerations for return to play. More information on the High Performance Hockey Masterclass can be found at anthonydonskov.gumroad.com. Thanks for listening. I believe that Tyler Artell article that we were referring to, the original one, was in 2001. So this is 22 years later. But I will say this, from my personal experience and the colleagues that I speak to that are in high-performance hockey, there's certainly some consequences, unintended maybe, maybe not, that came from that. One of which is now what's happening in all of sports, which is metrics, 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 measure, 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 which there's nothing wrong with that. Having said that, it leads to my second article that I read called adductor strains in athletes. This was a huge aha moment for me. When I say those unintended consequences, those are adductor squeeze tests. It doesn't matter what company, there's plenty of people out there selling that right now as a measure of asymmetry and potentially injury predictions. I think what was really surprising to me, Mal, is that, you know, one of my mentors, Dan Pfaff, always said that there's a lot of things right now. There's a lot of noise. There's there's a little bit of signal. It's really, really good to have two things to try to filter out the noise. Number one, really good mentors, smart people that can, can open your eyes in some capacity, and also a really good understanding of first principle knowledge. What's first principle knowledge to me? An understanding of rudimentary physics, physiology, biomechanics, and we would talk about social interaction skills as a coach. You know, for me, after reading that article and reading your article, I was slapped in the face almost a little bit in a good way because I feel like I ignored the physics portion of it and the neurophysiological portion of it. So if you could, could you give me an idea? And I can read because I have notes on this, this most recent article, the adductor strains in athletes. There were three key requirements for hip adduction strength testing for asymmetry. And here they are. A, a comparison can be made between the involved and non-involved sides. Number two, a comparison can be made between the agonist adductors and antagonist abductor muscle groups. And three, which you referred to previously, the unit of measure for strength allows comparisons across multiple populations. Could you expand a little on these for me as these tenants, if you will? So the history of the squeeze test as a measure of adduction strength It was really developed as a provocative test, a symptom test, and we've done some work on that, looking at squeeze tests, Uh, but all this Christian Thorberg in Denmark did work on that. And then uh, right around the time we showed that weakness of your adductors was a risk factor for adductor strains, there was a NHL league-wide study which said that weakness was not a risk factor. And in that test, they used the same dynamometer that we used. But what they did was they had people lying down, knees bent, and they squeezed the dynamometer between their legs. And they would actually report numbers for the right and the left leg. And I'm going like, how do you do that? You squeeze something between your legs, Newton's third law of react action and reaction. I think it's his third law. That's it. <laughs> is for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when you squeeze something, the force on each side is the same. Now, then we have things now where we have force frames, where you'll have transducers, force transducers on the right and the left, and you squeeze with your legs separated by something. I don't know how you can have a measure on the right that's different from the left. And like if you're ever in something like that, even if you 
put a chair between your legs and try to squeeze it, try to squeeze with all your might on the right and half of your might on the left. I don't know how you can do that. Yeah. You're going to move. That's right. So squeeze tests, they can give you a measure of strength. I think it might be a measure of strength of maybe the weaker of the two. I don't know. It kind of makes my brain hurt to think about this. But the other thing is, even if it was valid, even if there was a valid measure of measuring where it doesn't violate Newton's law, there's other stuff I'll talk about in a minute. If you're comparing the right and the left and you're trying to come up with a difference, all that we understand about clinically significant differences between a right and a left or dominant and non-dominant, whatever way we want to from one side to the other, what is a clinically significant difference? All our understanding of what really is a clinically significant difference is based on unilateral testing, not squeezing together at the same time. There is a neurological component as well that we call the bilateral deficit, so that if you exert maximal effort with the right and left side at the same time, so like you can test this in knee extension strength testing where you push out with both legs at the same time, that total will always be less than the sum of the right and the left put together, even when you try to control with for all the other confounding variables, because the brain isn't as good at activating both at the same time versus one versus the other, which makes sense. I mean, when would you ever activate both at the same time? So that confused me with doing bilateral tests. I didn't think it, it made sense. So then... The other thing is when we test strength of the handheld dynamometer and we're testing abduction and adduction strength, the person's in sideline. Yes. So you're they're in sideline, and so abduction strength, they raise their leg up and we push it down with a handheld dynamometer. And so the opposite reaction that they are able to stabilize against is the table that they're lying on. Sure. So if now you put someone on their back, and even if you do a unilateral test and they're sort of lying on the floor and they abduct their leg and they say, okay, don't let me, don't let me adduct it back in. So we're pushing back in, testing their strength. Depending on the friction between their ass and their back on the floor, they're just going to spin around in a circle because you need to be able to stabilize. So if you're testing abduction and adduction strength lying on your back on the floor, you would need to, if you're testing the right leg, somebody needs to stand by the shoulder and brace that shoulder so that the person doesn't rotate. It's still not a great position for testing. And one of the things is you need to provide stability, stabilization, so that the person can maximally activate all the muscle units in a given muscle group that they're trying to isolate for the test. And when you're trying to test a given muscle group, your hip abductors, it doesn't mean that other muscle groups aren't going to be working. The other, other muscle groups are going to be working a lot to help you stabilize, to give a maximal effort from the target muscle group you're trying to test. So the stabilization is really important. We did a study a long time ago, and it was kind of interesting. We never actually published the second part of it. I think we presented at a meeting, but we measured quadricep strength and hamstring strength in a biodex. So you, you have someone sit like this, unstabilized and they're kicking up and down and you'll see their body rocking all over the place. And we did un totally unstabilized. Then we did different levels of stabilization. And the last level of stabilization was holding on, chest strapped in, legs strapped down, so maximal stabilization. We showed, obviously, when they're unstabilized, they're much weaker than when they're fully stabilized. Sure. But what we did was we measured their trunk extension and flexion strength isometrically. And we showed that how much strength you lose by going from stabilized to unstabilized is a function of how strong or how weak your trunk extensors and flexors are. So if you've got strong trunk flexors and extensors, you're able to stabilize yourself so you're able to produce more force. But that's not helping you isolate how your quadriceps function is if it's a quadriceps test or your hamstring test. The same thing applies when you're doing other tests, abduction, adduction, hip flexion. You need to provide stability. So one of the things, hip flexion test, I like it a lot. It's not that reproducible. It's a noisy test, but it's a clinically useful test. And in that test, it's we do it in seating, in seated. We make sure they hold on to the front of the table. 
not with their hands back by their sides, because then they'll lean back, they'll bring in their abdominal muscles, the rectus femoris muscle, and we're really trying to isolate the iliosuus when we do that test. And the other thing is, they're pushing, they're sitting on a table and you're pushing down. You've got the table, unless the table is going to break, you've got maximal stabilization for them to resist against. One thing that we did do, we tested a linebacker one time, and Tim Tyler was testing him, and he's a big guy, probably weighs 300 pounds. Linebacker paid, weighed probably 350 pounds. And the guy was strong, and the dynamometer just broke into about three pieces of that. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it proved the point that we, okay, we are getting close. The person's able to give a maximal effort. Just the dynamometer wasn't uh, strong enough to withstand that. And the thing broke. It was kind of funny, but it kind of highlighted the limitations and tests. You know, you need to be strong as a tester. So if you're going to test a, a team in a training camp where 60 people are going to be coming through, you're going to be exhausted by the end of the day. You might need a tear cuff surgery the next day. It's hard work. Yeah. And so that's why we're trying to develop dynamometers to take the human out of the handheld dynamometer situation. So there is a need for these dynamometers, but we just need to go back to first principles, as you said, and understand the limitations and how we should properly be doing these tests. Well, I can tell you, I read that article and uh, it was a huge aha moment. A bit, one of the bigger aha moments I've had in the last five years. So I want to reiterate a couple points here with this article. Setup is crucial for the handheld dynamometer. Sideline for adduction and abduction. You did send me a video, so I do know what that looks like. You also have that explained, correct me if I'm wrong, in that article, adductor strains in ice hockey. Is there a picture? Yeah, there's a picture in that article. Yeah. We're going to post that to show notes. So the setup is, is critical. There is a skill to using a handheld dynamometer. So Mike Mullaney is one of our consultant physical therapists. He is the vice president of the American Academy of Sports Physical Therapy right now. And he is a master with the handheld dynamometer. He's probably tested more baseball players than anyone in the world. Wow. Uh, with a handheld dynamometer, pitchers. And we've done a ton of research in that area. It's got to the stage where I'm usually as little data boy. I'll write down <laughs> with the numbers. Of season I've seen him do it so many times. Like he'll be testing uh, external rotation in the shoulder. And I'll know by his movement and the interaction with the pitcher, okay, that's probably about a 16. And then he'll go 16.6. And, you know, just I've seen him do it so many times. And we've got this stage now. One of our tests we're doing is middle finger flexion strength Jeez. in baseball. And with the same device, and he's so reproducible with it. But that's the skill of doing the test. So you can't just go and take a device and oh, this has been validated, and then somebody goes and uses it. And they need to know how to use it. But that applies for a dynamometer, or an isokinetic dynamometer. You can't just say, well, uh, yeah, this has been shown to be valid for testing, whatever. And then you get somebody who's never used it before and tester who has maybe tested three people in the, their life, verbal cues, setup, orientation to the joints, then the athlete understanding what they're being asked to do. All those things. These are performance measures. Sure. And they're going to have, there's going to be a variability in the athlete's ability to reproduce their performance from rep to rep, from day to day. And there's going to be a variability in the tester and hurry out the test with the athlete. So we got to understand the noise that is inherent in any of the measurements. And we have to factor that into an, our interpretation of the data. Let me ask you this question off the cuff. For a person like me, I'm not a physical therapist. I'm a strength and conditioning coach. After reading your article, I am very much inclined to potentially invest in something like that. How do you go about educating yourself? Are there resources out there that would help an individual or is it just trial and error, make your mistakes? How do you recommend someone green like myself using something like that for the first time? So the perfect example would be this year's NHL Combine. The picture that's in that article that you're going to share and the videos that I shared with you, yep. we did for that to say, here's how we want to do the test. There were 106 players. You really want the one tester because there's tester variability. But in reality, as I said, you don't want one player testing 106 players in three hours. Yes. Uh, so two testers, 
And this is this is really when you get into the practice of things, you realize there are practical limitations to doing anything. And I went down with the two guys. They were experienced with the device, but they, in their clinics, used it differently from what I was saying we should do. And we just went over it. I tested them. They tested me. We got it down. We spent 15 minutes together. They'd seen the videos. They were absolutely perfect. Their data was perfect. I actually did a little thing and, okay, here's what I think this data should look like based on my reams of data on NHL prospects that we've tested and boom, I put it all together and went, wow, these guys couldn't be closer to the money than if I did it myself, having done the same thing a hundred times. So it doesn't take that much teaching. It's more understanding the principles involved and where you can go wrong. And you can go wrong all the time, especially in a long day. And there's people talking. And what I like to think, and I tell our researchers all the time, when you're doing testing an athlete, you need a box, an imaginary box to come down over your head with four walls that you can't interact with everybody around you. You know, if I see someone getting a strength test and then somebody comes in, they're testing a patient. And while they're testing the patient, Somebody comes in and says, oh, can you fit Mrs. Jones in at 12 o'clock tomorrow? And I'm going like, well, that strength test has gone out the window. <laughs> yep. So understanding later, and especially when you've got athletes, you don't want the other athletes standing in line going, oh, that wasn't such a good effort. And, <laughs> and when we do a lot of work with college hockey and we test people in a limited time span and we've got them lined up outside and everybody can hear everybody else's results. So there's some feedback there that's going to enter some noise into the testing you try to make sure that you're getting a maximal effort out of the people and it's you know but that's the nature of working in sports with athletes the other thing that you'd mentioned that you said you made a couple mistakes in terms of your measurement early in those research studies and you mentioned in the 2003 article comparison across populations Newtons, Newton meters, Newton meters per kilogram of body mass. Could you explain to the listener why, again, uh, one would use Newton meters per kilogram of body mass as opposed to Newtons? So you could have somebody, let's see, if I can think of some hockey players, short, Marty San Louis. He's yep. kind of like my size, short, short legs. Sure. Uh, tall player. Uh, Mark Stahl, right? So yep. two people, two totally different statures. You're measuring abduction strength and you measure 100 newtons of force at the ankle in somebody short and somebody long. Well, the actual torque that the muscles are generating and the muscles, in order to move, you're trying to generate a torque around a joint to move you. The guy with a longer arm, that's a much greater torque. Torque, I see. I, so Biomechanics. <laughs> you can have a short, stocky guy who might actually be the same weight as the tall, skinny guy. And if they're both producing the same force at the ankle, the tall, skinny guy has much stronger if they were the same body weight. So you need the torque by kilogram body weight in order to compare. Why you can get away with it by saying, okay, well, I measured the Newtons at the ankle and I divided it by their body weight. And we could do pounds per pound or Newtons per Newton body weight. That gets you approximately there because most people that are taller with longer arms, longer limbs are heavier, but it's not exact. It doesn't sure. count for the short, stocky, heavy guy. And this would be a big thing where you've got these real big, strong guys who are not that tall, who've got short lever arms. So they need to be a lot stronger to generate in terms of that force in order to be able to generate a comparable torque to somebody with a longer lever arm that's a similar weight. That's essentially what we're talking about. So some people are better than we think they are. So, and I think that's where it affects people most when you've got a whole team. Some of your low score guys, they might be better than you think. I'm going to wrap this up with a bow. You tell me if I'm right. These were the aha moments for me based on my first principles knowledge of your adductor strains. Two physics. One was Newton's third law for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. You cannot get asymmetry from squeezing together, right? And yeah looking at torque and limb length. One will produce more torque with longer limbs. That's a physics lesson. 
And then the other one is physiology, this idea of the bilateral deficit, adding forces together as opposed to amalgamating the forces at once are going to give us different readings, which make it quote unquote non-valid. And for these reasons, we need to test the limbs interdependently to be able to get these ratios. Am I accurate with all those limitations? Yes, and that's perfectly correct. And we also need to know what magnitude of difference if we're interested in asymmetries. Funny that the asymmetry and uh, LSI, limb symmetry index, came in, and I'm going like, we used to use the word deficit. That was like perfectly understandable. But that was my, that, that was my more, next note, Doc. That was my next note right more there. Technical. But we need to understand what size of difference, regardless of whether we call it something fancy like LSI or just a deficit, what represents a clinically or practically important difference. And that will depend on the experience of the tester, regardless of whether it's with a handheld dynamometer or with a nice kinetic dynamometer or some other device. We need, roughly speaking, the rule of thumb we use is if the difference between the right and the left is more than 20%, that's a real difference. If the difference is between 10 and 20%, we call that equivocal. And it might be real, it may not be real. Then we start thinking about, well, how experienced is the tester? If the tester is really experienced, we might lower our threshold. The 15% might be real, but 10 to 20% is equivocal. If the difference is less than 10%, that's normal. And that applies to side to side differences, also applies to have I improved my strength. Like, oh, you've you've got a player, you're training, and this is for individual muscle group tests where we're testing the strength of a hip abductor, an adductor, or knee extensors. When you're looking at individual muscle function, we want to know if somebody has improved their strength. If it's more than a 20% improvement, it's a real change. If it's 10 to 20%, it's within the equivocal zone. If it's less than 10%, it's no change. And I learned that early, and I learned the performance metrics early, testing patients. And I had a patient who'd had an ACL reconstruction, and I tested them like three weeks before, and, and she wanted to be tested again. And I said, you, it's three weeks is too short a period of time. You're not. You're only rehabbing twice a week, this and that. And I said, no, no. I, so I tested her non-involved leg first. And then this is in the days before cell phones. And then <laughs> while I'm switching the dynamometer around, she gets on the phone and phones her boyfriend. And a, and a woman answers the phone. <laughs> and next thing I hear this woman screaming and this and that. And boom, slams the phone, nearly breaks our phone on the wall. Gets back on the dynamometer and her strength from the, uh, on the involved <laughs> side compared to three weeks previously went up about 50% <laughs> because it was a confounding variable. That's right. That's right. So we have to understand. That's why the conditions in which you test have to be replicated every time. There's so many confounders. It's interesting. I, I was, I spoke, uh, this is off the cuff, but it's a story I keep coming back to. One of the individuals I had the opportunity to interview was Dr. Matt Jordan. And his supervisor at the University of Calgary was, you know, one of the world-renowned muscle physiologists, Walter Herzog. Yep. And he told me, Matt, during the course of our interview that, that Walter, at some point in his career, started shifting to studying and doing research in humans to animals. He said, humans are so complex. There's so many confounders. There's a million not, not that animals are any simpler, but I certainly think if you got a hamster in a cage running in a wheel, you can control a lot more <laughs> than, than it is a human, right? I always say clouds and clocks. The other thing I come back to a lot, and I think it was Epictetus that said this. I say it quite a bit when it comes to testing. It's a stoic quote I come back to. It goes something to this effect that no man steps in the same river twice. He's not the same man and it's not the same river. There's just so many confounders and it's very difficult to control those in the live environment. It's funny you bring up Walter Herzog and because I'm very familiar with his research. And I have tried to, mostly unsuccessfully, apply some of the things he studies in animal models to human models. And actually, uh -huh. when we started out, I mentioned about studying viscoelasticity of muscle, which I did with Peter Magnuson in the early 1990s. 
That was trying to replicate work that was being done at Duke University under Dr. Bill Garrett, looking at the viscoelasticity of muscle and its relation to muscle injury. They tore the muscles of rabbits, thousands of rabbits, and published maybe 10 different studies. And we took some of this work and said, well, let's see if we can measure viscoelastic stress relaxation, viscoelastic creep and hysteresis in human muscles and human hamstrings we were mostly interested in. And we were able to do that, but it was pretty difficult in trying to figure it out and trying to figure out how the contractile and the non-contractile properties of muscles work together and how that works in a performance situation is really difficult and it can be done in animal models and it is done in animal models and we try to do it in human models. You know, we're limited by what we can measure and we're learning to measure things better. So now we can measure fascicle length changes in human muscles during voluntary contractions and movements. And and what we find is that, you know, we teach eccentric contractions, concentric contractions. Uh, Concentric contractions, the muscle fibers are shortening. Eccentric contractions, the muscle fibers are lengthening. In reality, during concentric contractions, the muscle tendon units are shortening. The fibers are probably shortening. During eccentric contractions, the muscle tendon units are lengthening, but the fibers are actually working isometrically. The purpose is the tendon and aponeurosis absorb most of that lengthening. And it uses it as elastic energy and the fibers just work isometrically to allow the elongation to be transferred to tissues that have elastic properties. And that's why there's very few movements that any animal does, well, probably none, that are not stretch shortening cycle movements. Sure. And the purpose of that is to efficiency, to get elastic energy out of our tendons and our aponeuroses so that we're not using as much metabolic energy to perform functions. And we can be more explosive. We can jump higher, whatever, when we use the elastic energy in our bodies. So trying to understand that and trying to figure out how it works, that's what I'm thinking about all the time when I'm when I'm trying to say, okay, how does this translate to performance? Doc, you're on fire. I want to come back to one point that you brought up earlier. You talked about these asymmetries greater than 20%, equivalency of 10 to 20%. You called it minimally significant difference. I want to make sure I understand that right. You said essentially based on all of the work that the practitioner has done within their targeted field, they're the ones that interpret that difference, right? Would that be the same as interpreting something on an effect size? If I'm looking at a research paper, not a p-value, that's statistically significant. I want to look at the effect size and then interpret that in my own environment. Is that similar? Am I on the right track there? Yeah, effect sizes are are similar. So the 20% is based on what the margin of error is, how noisy is the measurement. So effect Get size it. gets to that. I mean, now we're, everyone's saying, oh, you got to put an effect size in your manuscripts and whatever. And I think they're getting a little overused. When you have a small sample size, a study, and you have a significant effect, and then the person says, oh, we had a very large effect size. I go, yeah, of course you had a large effect size because if it wasn't a large effect size, it wouldn't have been statistically significant because your sample's pretty small. Sure. And so people get a little carried away. Where effect sizes are useful is for when something is statistically significant, but it's not really practically significant. So what was significant at the 0.01 level, but the effect size was only 0.2 or, you know, that which which is meaningless in, in most situations. Let me ask you this, an unrelated question, but it's important. I just selfishly want to learn. When you're reading research for exercise science, strength and conditioning coach, performance specialist, we're dealing with small samples because they're elite populations. What do you like to look at? Confidence intervals, effect sizes. What are you drawn to when you read research, specifically in these areas? Well, so if you're thinking about you're working with athletes and you're training them and you've got a measurement here, and a measurement here, and you've got 25 athletes, and they've all done this, and you've got a test here and a test here. The thing that I'm most interested in is the change from here to here, from pre to post, and the standard deviation of that change. Other people will look at 95% confidence intervals. My mind is just more in tune with what that standard deviation, standard deviation of the difference. 
So, and that's what I also look at for reliability and whether a test is noisy and how noisy a test is and how much of a difference will I need to see in order to be able to say it's a real change. It's basically, I want to know what the standard deviation of the difference is. So some people will say there's like limits of agreement, the 95% limits of agreement. But basically that's 1.96 times the standard deviation. And what it means is you can be 95% sure if your number is beyond the 95% limits of agreement that it's a real change. And that's very strict in terms of because only saying like a five percent on either end going up or going down but just basically once you have the difference and the standard deviation of the difference if it's repeated measures meaning you've got an athlete you're testing twice you're training or whatever and if you just have a, a population of athletes and you've got a measurement on them you want to know how variable that measurement is across the population. That would be the population standard deviation. So you'd say the average anaerobic power for this team on a Wingate test was 14 watts per kilogram body weight, plus or minus five. Got it. So what I do with that information is, okay, if it's plus or minus five and the average is 14, if you are less than nine, so 14 minus five is nine, less than nine, you're below average for the population. If you're above 19, 14 plus five, you're above average and everybody else is in the middle zone. You I might see. switch that to 0.5 of a standard deviation versus one standard deviation for saying above and below average, depending on how large your sample is and what your question is. But that's kind of how we can frame where people fall in. Like it's good to be normal. <laughs> And yeah. are you in the normal lens and you want to identify. And if you have all those tests, the person who's number one and the person who's number 100, there's probably error in their data. You know, it's like when you do the SATs, they get the highest score or whatever. If you do it again, you're going to come down. You're going to regress yep. to the mean. Regress you to me. Lucky or whatever. And vice versa, if you if you bomb on the SAT, do it again, you'll probably do better. It's called regression to the mean. Me. Sure. But, yeah, we got to understand that our outliers are outliers for a reason. And occasionally you'll get an athlete who's an outlier and they're like, wow, that, that, that number is actually real. That's incredible. Yeah. But you got to understand that those are rare moments. There's noise in your data. Doc, uh, two questions. Number one, what are you currently looking at in terms of some research questions that are on the table right now? And then where can listeners learn more about you if you do have website, social media, et cetera? So I'll do the second bit first. The social media thing, I, I'm i like an old curmudgeon. I said, I don't do it. It's, <laughs> I can't, uh, and I tell people all the time, this is why I don't do Twitter or whatever, because I'll well, one I'll curse too much. And <laughs> it's, I was at a conference, IOC conference in Monaco a bunch of years ago, and the editor in chief of BJSM was up saying, You gotta tweet out those results, telling people you gotta tweet out the results. And I'm going like a medical journal shouldn't be telling people to tweet results. Twitter is for opinions. You know, we're about data and we're about, yes, so we don't do a good job of, say, maybe marketing our research, but going on Twitter is just a bunch of people expressing their opinions and you end up spending all your time arguing about stuff. Whereas mm -hmm. I let the data speak. So, you know, the problem is, there's, is there good access to data? Is it reasonably understood? Trying to get things across. You know, I, as years ago, Pittsburgh Steelers drafted a linebacker in the first round of the draft, and in preseason, he injured his groin. And so some journalist called me and says, oh, what do you think about this guy injuring his groin? The first journal, I said, yeah, well, stuff happens. I think I said, shit happens, whatever. <laughs> so, you know, and, and they called back. We called me a weekly and said, he's still not back. Do you think they're doing the wrong thing? And I says, it's University of Pittsburgh. They have the, some of the best muscle researchers in the world. Their docs are some of the best in the world. I can't tell what's going on. This is they're more expert than I am. And then he called me back because the guy, and the guy ended up being a, a multi-year all pro in the NFL. He got I played. But eventually I says, you know what your problem is? Good medicine doesn't make good news. 
you're trying to make a story out of something where there's no story. Why don't you make a story and say, oh, this is guy's being treated conservatively so that he doesn't have an injury recurrence. And we should do that more often instead of putting people hamstring strains back in two weeks and then they re-injure themselves. And that's the type of information that needs to get out. So sometimes I get annoyed with people having an, an agenda of how they're trying to. So I try not to get involved in online discussions and tweet things out or doing other social media. But, you know, Googling my name and you find research and other stuff on our own website, nismat.org, lists all our research, mostly if we update it in time, whatever. And, and I send out research to people all the time, studies and, and other articles that um, are of interest that are maybe more easily understood by a lay population. What am I working on now? Uh, good question. I'm never able to answer that question. I look at my computer here. I've got my to-do list, and it goes down to 13. And some of them could be totally obscure studies. Some of them are, well, one is I have to look at the uh, combine norms, getting back to what we started with. I need to yeah. get back on and start assimilating that data, getting new data in. I'm doing a lot of work in vertical jump research, force plate yep. jumping data. It's yep. a big interest of mine. When I mean, you mentioned first principles, this is sort of one of these moments that you get in your career and you, it's like an aha moment. And it was a poor student was presenting a study at a meeting and they were doing, and it was clearly a student project where they had some data said, and they wanted to look at predictors of vertical jump height from force plate data. And it wasn't his fault. The student was a male student. It was clearly his advisor not instructing him properly. So he showed all these, you know, average power, peak power, vertical velocity at takeoff and this and that, and did the correlations with the jump height. And his conclusion was vertical velocity at takeoff was not strongly correlated with jump height. So this guy in the audience puts his hand up and comes to Q&A and says, I've just got a question for you. You said, did you say vertical velocity at takeoff is not strongly correlated with jump height? <laughs> And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, it wasn't. And um, he says, you know, that's interesting because that refutes everything Sir Isaac <laughs> Newton ever said. And I went, that's obnoxious, but it's a memory that you'll have. <laughs> and it was because vertical velocity at takeoff is how we measure it, John. That's right. That's right. And if it's not correlated, you have measurement error there. So you've actually provided a measure of what your measurement error is somewhere in the system. But it was a learning moment. You've got to understand. Your, and so in force plate information, so vertical velocity at takeoff is measured now from these force plates from taking the propulsive impulse divided by your body mass in kilograms gives you your vertical velocity and takeoff. So your net propulsive impulse. So one of the metrics people are reporting is how does my net propulsive impulse change over time? That's an important measure. That represents, and you got this, some people tell me these gears, and one of them is this measure. And I'm going like, that's your vertical velocity at takeoff. That's your jump height. So it's like you need to understand what you're dealing with. It may be important, but it's jump height. And some people move away from jump height and force plate stuff. And I said, well, that's what you're asking the athlete to do. Jump as high as possible. So you can't ignore the thing you're asking them to do. Yes, other measurements. are in. So that's one area that I'm interested in right now that I've been doing some work in. Legacy, you've been doing this a long time. Probably a lot of individuals have had the opportunity to be mentored underneath you. You're leaving an indelible mark. You're a fantastic human being. I'm proud to call you colleague, even though we've met very, very briefly. What do you want your legacy to be remembered as now? just that we made a difference that the research made a difference so it's good that we did the study on the hip strength and the hockey players as you said it was 2000 was when we did it people are still using that so that's useful that's good to know things that we've done in the recovery area so most athletes now and very across many sports take cherry juice as a recovery drink Yep, it's a vasodilator. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. The early research, the first research done on that was 2005. I did with my colleague, Declan Connolly, who passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. 
those are things I like to see, you know, that we started and people are still using it. And basically, I want my legacy is that if somebody looks at what you did and they go, so what? So I want to avoid people saying, so what? But you have to be humble. In all disciplines, you have to be humble. And when I got my PhD, my brother said to me, wait a minute. What have you got to have a PhD in exercise physiology? He says, wait a minute. <laughs> got, so I had a bachelor's degree in physical education, a master's in physical education. He says, so you've got three degrees in running and jumping. <laughs> and so, I said, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I heard this once, Doc. You know more and more about less and less until you know absolutely everything about nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our guest today has been Mal McHugh. Doc, I can't thank you enough for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's fun talking. 